So good afternoon. So it's a pleasure to have very distinguished guests today with us. Professor David Delacroix, who is expert in economics. He came uh, to Poland from Louvain in Belgium. And Professor, who is well-known uh, 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 well Polish philosopher, Jan Woleński, from Krakow and from Rzeszów, I, I should say, I think. Uh, Professor Delacroix is, uh, so he is uh, at the moment in, in Belgium, but he, he was visiting many different universities and working at many different uh, places in, in the world. And uh, your topic is economics, of course, but uh, so there are different aspects of your studies, but what was especially interesting for me, you study how human resources, including knowledge and academia and uh, education, these aspects of, of human resources could influence uh, economic growth. And uh, Professor Jan Woleński, as I said, he is a renowned uh, philosopher. Uh, he had a very important contribution to analytic philosophy, uh, legal theory, logic, epistemology, philosophy of language, and the list is much longer, but I will uh, stop here. And the subject that we are going to discuss today is the rational universe. I am Sebastian Szybka from Krakow here, from uh, Astronomical Observatory. I'm a physicist by training and cosmologist. So for me, the rational universe, if I think what does it mean, it's, I think it's uh, quite, I don't know, maybe complicated, but at the same time, simple idea. We, I mean, physicists, astronomers, observe some physical phenomena, this phenomena turn out not to be, uh, they are correlated in some way, there are relations between them, we can find these relations, so we discover physical laws, and the physical laws of, mathem are of mathematical nature, we can use physical laws to predict what will happen in the future, what was in the past, to understand the universe. And the universe has this property that we can comprehend it and we can understand those. So for me, universe is rational and, and because physical laws exist and they can be, yeah, we can discover them. But uh, I guess that uh, Professor Wolenski as a philosopher has probably much uh, wider perspective on, on this problem. So my question is what, what do you mean, what philosophers mean by the rational universe? How do you understand this concept? Okay, thank you for inviting me to this very interesting session. Uh, so my uh, introduction is conceptual and philosophical. So uh, etymologically speaking, uh, uh, ratio in Latin is related to rare, calculate. So we have a connection direct connection with uh, mathematics and it was all, always, uh, mathematics was considered as a rational science. Of course, there are several other issues, for example, rational numbers uh, and so on. So this term in rational, term rational is quite ambiguous and there are two meanings, in fact. Unfortunately, in English, uh, there are not very well, well distinguished. But in Polish, we have racjonalny and racjonalistyczny. Uh, so, uh, what is the first? Royalance on reason as the best guide for belief and action. I think that David will speak more about about this. Uh, it is also well known in uh, uh, daily life. People are rational, irrational, behave rationally, irrationally. Uh, but uh, uh, this uh, rationalistic is uh, mostly related to very deep philosophical 
questions. So, uh, in, in philosophy, um, uh, rationalism is a theory that the exercise of reason rather than experience, authority, or spiritual revelation provides the primary basis for knowledge. So, once again, this both rational and rationalistic, rationalistic is rather the second, are uh, uh, epistemological. Kazimierz Ajdukiewicz, an eminent Polish uh, philosopher, uh, introduced still another meaning in order to distinguish from rationalist, he called uh, anti irrationalist, so rationalist as uh, anti irrationalism. Uh, it was uh, against or versus irrational, so there are misprint uh, rational. Uh, into national, maybe not so uh, stupid <laughs> in <laughs> our days. So uh, rational in this sense, anti-rational, means that knowledge which is uh, uh, intersubjectively by language communicable and testable. And there is a claim that science is rational in this sense, and also ordinary life should be as uh, uh, well. Now this uh, uh, rationality as it is used, present days I guess, concerns such things like, like decisions, games, and also I think that second speaker will, or, or David will speak about. Uh, this problem uh, more. Uh, now we have uh, in philosophy a uh, dualism or uh, division of epistemological views into rationalist and empiricism. Uh, so the former relies on innate ideas, intuition as an access to essence, etc. Typical philosophers, Plato, and nowadays, for example, Edmund Husser. I remember my teacher, Roman Ingarden, who was uh, Husser's student, so he uh, tried to convince us that a special kind of intuition is the fundament uh, base of uh, uh, knowledge. However, uh, in history of philosophy, we have also another uh, uh, division, namely between so called in Latin ratio cognoscendi, so reason, epistemological reason, yes, and versus ratio. Essendi or existentia, which of course is the first is epistemological, second is ontological or metaphysical, and concern not knowledge but reality, whatever it is. So reality is rational because there is something like ratio essendi or ratio existentia. So is it, uh, uh, now there is a problem, is the universe that is everything what exists rational, there is subordinated to the universal principle or principles. We have knowledge, epistemic or epistemological fact, uh, if we apprehend the principle in question. So it is, of course, a scheme because it requires uh, further elaboration. What is the principle? And, uh, several philosophical 
uh, examples, so I will uh, mention some of them. First is Plato, so the world of ideas is ordered, is not quite clear in, in which way, according to Plato, however, it is ordered, and the, also is the ultimate idea, uh, namely idea of goodness, uh, which enlight everything. More or less mystical is this interpretation, however, reason is clear. There is a principle of ordering, ideal reality. But Plato was not particularly interested how uh, things are shadows of ideas or something more, and they are rational or not. Even of course, there's a historical question. Aristotle. Aristotle uh, considered reality as uh, hierarchy of um, species uh, ordered by generality. So being is on the top of this ordering. So there are essences, relations between essences are stable, conceptual, uh, of course, we know by experience, according to Aristotle, but this ordering is independent of our uh, knowledge. Other, uh, other uh, uh, examples, Leibniz, once again, it is not easy to interpret him. However, there is infinite God's mind and reality is conceived by this or ordered like uh, concepts, essences are uh, related. Other examples, Spinoza uh, is uh, identity of God and nature, so and uh, nature must be rational because God is uh, uh, rational. Now, uh, other for uh, Kant, as usually, he devastated everything. So knowledge is rational. Categories are rational. What about reality? We don't know because reality is a system of things in themselves. So we simply impose conceptual structure on this, uh, on this uh, system. So you, you see that in philosophy there are several uh, attempts to explain this uh, order of mm, uh, essences. Now a popular view which will be, uh, I think, more elaborated than was mentioned by Sebastian, uh, it's a very popular view that the universe is rational because it is mathematical and can be rationally known for that reason. So mathematics is rational by definition and uh, why uh, mathematics, I don't know, it is a problem of genesis of mathematics. Anyway, there is a correspondence between mathematical as uh, system of mathematical structures and reality. This is a very popular view in Krakow, I, I guess, but not only. Uh, there is a weaker uh, possibility, namely that uh, reality is not mathematical and mathematicized. And I believe in this weaker sense because, okay, we, we see this place. I don't know whether it is a mathematical structure or not, but certainly it can be described mathematically that some people are on left side and so on. So another possibility also logical is that 
uh, universe, the universe is an aggregate or the aggregate, neurological sum of things, and certainly it is not mathematical in, in classical sense, but I think that you, you will defend uh, your, your view. Now we have special problems. For example, limits of rationality. Knowledge is epistemological concept, uh, but also there is a question of limits in the rationality of being rational in the universe. Example, even if we believe that uh, physical reality is mathematical and rational in this sense, what about human reality? It is uh, reducible to physical reality or not? It's a question which usually is overlooked by cosmologists, for example. Because even if physical reality is rational, in above sense, mathematical or mathematized, so it doesn't imply that human reality is rational in this sense. Uh, another uh, problem is genesis of, genesis of rationality. Genesis of uh, uh, rationality in this uh, on, in sense of ontological reality. It is natural or, for example, created. The second view is quite popular. Uh, and related, of course, to religious faith. How, and in this sense, the answer is very simply. God created uh, the universe and Leibniz should say had no, had no other chance than doing this in a rational way, whatever it means. However, it is a problem for theology, theologians, it was the only possibility. Uh, but the problem for naturalists is how rationality, structure of the universe arose if it was not conceived by a transcendental uh, being. Uh, so, of course, it, this question this problem answer depends on uh, deeper or so, 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 some assumptions. So there's a philosophy of this question, of course, quite schematic. However, uh, let me finish that for philosophers, at least like me, because uh, the principal sense of Rationality is related to epistemology. I mean that that's not, it is not only view. However, I think the most popular view, look at textbooks of philosophy, particularly in the analytic tradition. So this epistemological uh, uh, looking at rationality is prevailing. So rationality as uh, uh, an ontological category is rather considered in this tradition as something metaphorical. Thank you. So thank you for presenting your point of view. And I will, ask, uh, I will pose the same questions to Professor Delacroix. Thank you. Um, so when, when, when you first wrote me uh, asking whether I would like to participate to this uh, panel, um, I was a bit surprised. And then I asked what led you believe that I could say anything meaningful on the rational universe, which looked very uh, high level for, uh, compared to what I'm doing. And then you told me, oh, I looked a bit at your papers, and so you use mathematics to understand human behaviors, 
And so mathematics, it's one aspect of rationality. Maybe you could explain a bit what, uh, what you do there in economics with, what, when using mathematics and what is your view on the rationality of, of people. So I will try to do that, um, explain a little bit what we do uh, in economics. I think it's important because in many cases it's not well understood and, mis and it could be misinterpreted. Um, I will also try to contrast rational with optimal. That's uh, another dimension. And I will try also to make some, some, to stress some differences with what I believe is done in physics. But of course, my knowledge of physics is very limited, so it's more about my belief. Um, so I will, stress, I will also stress why it's important when we talk about uh, economic policy. And then finally, I want to, to maybe re-explain those things in, in a little example on which uh, I've worked uh, in the past, which is the example of Easter Island, so this island in the P Pacific Ocean, which is often seen as, a, an, as an allegory of an ecological catastrophe. So it speaks to today's worries about global warming and the possible environmental collapse. Okay, so rational, what, what do we mean in economics when we say we model rational behaviors or um, people are rational? So first, I think it means that the economic agent we model have an objective. So households, they try to reach the highest, we call it utility, but you could understand it as welfare for them. So that's the objective. The firms, usually we assume that the, the, the shareholders, they, they try to maximize profits, to maximize their, so they have this objective. Maybe the government, because it could also apply to a government, maybe it maximizes the chance of being uh, re-elected in the next elections in a democracy. So for example, so there is an objective. And then there are constraints. So people face constraints. And an old definition of economics, it's the way to allocate finite resources to unlimited needs. And so finite resources, those are the constraints. So for example, for a, a household, what are the constraints? There is a budget constraint, so the income, you cannot spend more than your income. There is also a time constraint. You have 24 hours in a day, so you cannot do more than those 25 hours, so and so on. So, and then there is a question of what, what, what we assume people believe about the future, about what others will do, and so on. And there we, you, we often use the idea of uh, rational expectations, which means that people don't make systematic mistakes. On average, they are correct. Of course, there is randomness and they make mistakes case by case, but on average, so if, if they tend to be too optimistic all the time, they will adjust and, and, and be correct on average. So that's the idea of rational expectations. Um, so it's about making choices, so we assume that households, firms, the government, they make choices, maximizing these objectives, subject to the constraints that are there. Um, and maybe I wanted to, to, to stress maybe a difference, uh, what I believe could be a difference with, with, with physics. So it's a bit technical, but I will try to explain it uh, really in uh, very general terms. Um, so when, when you are hiking in, in, on, on mountains, suppose you, you want to go to a certain peak there, and then there is just a tiny path following the, the, the ridge of the mountain that will lead to, the, to this peak. If you go a little bit on the left or a little bit on the right, so you will follow a path that will go down in a, in a valley either on the left or on the right. So, 
Then you have mathematical systems which have this property. You, you have a, maybe a stable, a steady state. You, you wonder whether you will reach it. And from where you are, there is only one choice that will lead you to the steady state. All the other choices, they will lead you either in the left or to the right, maybe to infinity or to zero or something like this. Only one. So it's a saddle, it's called a saddle path. Saddle path, we, in economics, we call it saddle path stability. So we love this property because it means in terms of choice, there is just one choice that will lead to the, to the peak, which is to follow the, this path go, going to, 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 the, to the summit you want to go. So there is just one choice, and so that's the one people will choose because they are rational, and that's what they want to do. While I think in physics, when you have this dynamical property, it's just unstable because particles do not make choices, I think. And so the likelihood that you will just start on the right path is almost zero. If you, you think there is a ch it's randomly distributed where you start, so it's very likely that you will either go to the left or to the right. So this, no, this stability feature, so in economics it's valued very much because there is a choice, although there is just one path going to the, the steady state, while if you look at a dynamical system of things that do not, make, do not make choice, they will never go there, they will go elsewhere. So it's a bit technical, but I think that the, the, I, I, I thought about that because one day in teaching this uh, saddle path stability, there was a student that was not trained in economics, but that was very strong in, uh, in uh, hard sciences. And he said, but it's not stable, it cannot be stable, and so on. I said, yeah, but it's saddle point stable, okay. Um, th then a word about uh, policy. So, you know, there are many uh, offices full of economists that make policy recommendations. It could be the central bank that could design a monetary policy. It could be some, uh, some ministry that has to give advice on uh, fiscal policy, whether to increase tax, to decrease tax, to change, uh, to manage the public debt. Or it could be also education policy. Should we make uh, universities free or should we ask people to pay for going to university? And so as an economist, when you think about all those, th those uh, possible policies, the answer is not automatic. So it's not just a direct effect of the policy because we believe people will behave, will react, will change their behavior precisely because in a sense they are rational and they maximize objectives, they have their constraint and if you change the tax system, if you change the university funding, people will do maybe something else, will also maybe uh, forecast other things. Uh, and it's very important to, to take that, in, that into account when you advise the policy. And there, the rationality assumption is very useful because it gives a discipline. So if people are rational, if you lower tax, for example, they know that the debt of the government will increase, and so maybe they will have to pay taxes in the future, and so that will affect their behavior today. Um, and so maybe the effect of lowering taxes on consumption will not be as, you would, as the one you would get if people were just myopic and non-optimizing uh, people. So the rationality assumption is really a discipline in order, in order to, to design these policies. Now, of course, we do not believe that people are in fact rational, but we think it's still a useful benchmark and a non-arbitrary benchmark because it's a kind of, uh, if you want to deviate from rationality, there are hundreds of ways in which you can deviate and that choice would be highly arbitrary. Um, 
That's what I wanted to see on policy. Then maybe a word on Easter Island to illustrate all these, all these topics. Um, maybe some of you have read the book by uh, Jared Diamond called Collapse, where he has explains a little bit the story of Easter Island. So I read this book on holiday, and then I said, but this is economics, so we should be able to model this and to better understand what are the parameters that are important for the story. So the story is like this. So Easter Island is probably the most remote uh, piece of land on Earth, so it's in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, and it was first uh, settled by Polynesian people coming from another island uh, very, very far, more than 1,000 kilometers. So they settled around 400 of our era, and um, then the population grew, maybe only, only 50 people came by boat, and then the population started to grow. And so the island is well known for the statue. You see the big statues of Easter Island, that they are called Moai. Um, and they started to build these Moai, uh, and they were competing clans. So each clan descending from one maybe initial father on the first boat. So they were starting to build all these Moais, and then the population is estimated to peak about uh, 10,000 people in uh, 1500. And then at some point, uh, Europeans came, Dutch explorers, and they discovered the island on um, Easter Monday, hence Easter Island. But then they were surprised because they saw some very poor people there, uh, but all these big statues. So they said there was in the past a great civilization on this island, but now these people look very miserable. Then what research has shown is that there was once a forest on the island that was completely uh, cut uh, by this large population that was once there in 1500. And so Diamond asked, how, how is it possible? You, you are on a small island, it's, a uni it's like Earth, it's a closed system, nobody could come in or out, and they cut all the trees. How, how, how could we think about this? Then, uh, so the idea, it, it, it emerged from the competition between clans, and so we, we model it in this way, so you can see what I mean by objectives, constraints, and so on. Um, we say, okay, when you are an adult, you, have to, you, you will have children. You know that when you will be old, you will depend on your kids to be fed. There is no pension system on Easter Island. Um, and so that's one thing. And then the, 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 the kids, when they will grow up, they will have to fight or bargain with the other clans in order to take some resource from the island. There are no property rights, so there is a kind of uh, fighting to, to, to get some resource that will be used to feed you when old. Then you, you know that, that, that is, you, you, you know this, so that's, that's rationality. And hence, you also know that the other clan, they, they behave like you. Uh, then what's rational for you to do, to do is to have a lot of kids so that your clan will have a big army in the future and that big army will be able to beat the others and to get more resources. And so the others, they take the same and this leads to, to a situation in which there is overpopulation because everyone wants to have a big army. It's purely rational but it's not optimal. Um, then you have overpopulation, and then overpopulation, you need to, you need to, to wood to cook, and you need also wood to make these big statues, which are also part of the competition between clans. And so at some point, it's uh, rational to, to completely destroy the forest. While in fact, it would have been optimal to, to discuss everyone around the table and to say and to plan and to, and to decide what to do with the, how to share the resources of the island without needing this overpopulation uh, dynamics. Um, 
And so, of course, you see the allegory of today. We know we need to tax uh, carbon emission, but of course, each country alone will not do it because it's not rational for them. And ideally, we would need to, to, to discuss uh, all together and, and, and make a plan, but that's very difficult. Um, and so that's to illustrate the difference between rationality and optimality. I think let's start with this. Okay, thank you. Uh, so maybe Professor Wolinski would like to comment on, on that somehow? Only two remarks, one historical, namely that Bronisław Malinowski investigated law, uh, custom and crime in primitive societies, was a Polish anthropologist. So according to him, state is not necessary to organize uh, primitive society. And there are some distribution of uh, obligations and rights, which is, so to speak, natural, which works. However, it is only in very small communities and isolated. But for example, take Aristotle, who was quite conscious that we have two problems, justice and rationality. One of uh, application of his famous division of distinction between distributive uh, and compensative justice. It is a problem in all societies. For example, in France, it is a problem of pension age. Yes, it is a question, a typical problem, how to uh, unify rationality and justice. So in modern societies, this optimality is not so simple as you, you think. So it's a model rather than a real analysis. We, 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 we have something similar in Poland now. So there's a tension between rationality and justice and other social values. Uh, thank you. <coughs> so I have noted several questions for both of you. Uh, so maybe I will uh, just start from what you, you, you have said, Professor Delacroix. Uh, because you, you, you compare economics to, to physics, and uh, I have to say that in physics we have, I mean, uh, if we have asked, because you were, you were talking in the language of dynamical system, I think, yes? So in physics, of course, if we have like unstable situation, uh, as you said, it could be that it, it can play a role. And, and the basic example is like a black hole shadow. Maybe you have seen images from even horizon telescope. And uh, you know, the, the black thing inside has a size of, uh, that corresponds to the unstable orbit. Because it doesn't matter for one particle, but if you have a bunch of particles, a lot of light coming, then this could distinguish two uh, uh, kinds of behavior. So this kind of system can play a role. Uh, moreover, I, I'm not an expert on that, but in uh, cognitive science, uh, this uh, kind of system with critical behavior, uh, they need this kind of system for modeling. I mean, uh, ordinary differential equations, because I think that the, and they believe that the human brain is like this kind of system that uh, can switch between different states and it's in some kind, uh, you have like uh, saddles and this um, unstable behavior between saddles. So you can jump from one state to another. It's like decision making. So uh, th th this kind of system playing a role in economics, as you said, and in physics as well. Uh, so my question is, because your assumption was that People think rationally, yes? You said there are agents and sometimes they are, it's not optimal, but usually they think rationally. But there was a book by, uh, a book by Richard Feynman, it's a very small book with a big title, 
the title was The Meaning of It All. And uh, there is one chapter which is called uh, Our Unscientific, This Unscientific uh, Age. And it was written in the 20th century. Uh, so uh, it could be strange, yes, that why unscientific age in 20th century, but he claimed something a little bit different than, than you say, but you can confirm it makes sense or, or, or not, that although the 20th century was the age of science, uh, he believed that the society behaved in a non-rational, non-scientific way. So like other mechanism that, uh, he said that even maybe a scientist, when, uh, he or she is doing science, he thinks in some scientific way, but then he come back home and make some decisions that are not uh, fully uh, scientific. So what, what do you think about this hypothesis that these basic agents could be not really rational or do, do you include them in, in, in economics? But, okay, as I said, the, the, the assumption of rationality is more a tool than a belief about uh, what people are, are, in fact. So you mean uh, to, uh, just something to construct uh, the model? And it's then to construct to... the model, and but we believe it is useful to make this assumption, and it still delivers interesting predictions. But of course, nobody believes that people are uh, fully rational uh, all the time and in all dimensions. So. Um, but still, so it's an important tool. And I think it's an important, also, it's also an important reference point. Because as I said, if you go away from rationality, there are so many ways in which you can do it. Uh, and it's hard to think how you could uh, discipline these uh, discrepancies with rationality. While rationality, it, it, you, 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 know, you know what it is. So that's a, maybe a remark on, on your previous point about the difference with physics. I think in terms of mathematical tools, what we stress more, it's all the, um, the um, optimality tools, uh, how maximizing stuff. Uh, that, that, that I guess in physics you don't do too much. While in, in, in a program in economics, there will be a lot of optimization, dynamic, static, uh, continuous time, time, discrete time, and so on. Because people optimize unlike uh, black holes. But. Um, so I worked in, in a specific area of physics and relativeness. Uh, and I, I have a question to Professor uh, Wolensky as well, because when you was presenting your, your view on, uh, I mean, what uh, rational, thinking is uh, meant by uh, philosophers, uh, you said something about innate uh, ideas, that we are born with some natural mechanism. And so my question is, because what, what I was learned, uh, uh, so what uh, physics teach us, I, I think, is that we should be very careful with, with these innate ideas. Because uh, I think that we have like a simplified model of the world that is uh, good for this case that we live in. So for the ordinary life and, uh, you know, to, to collect food and uh, uh, everything we need. But then when, when we go uh, to large scales or to small scales, so very basic notions like a distance, like a properties of things in, in quantum mechanics that uh, think has a given property bef before we measure it. I mean, this uh, stopped to work. work. So, so my question is, uh, in your definition, uh, rational thinking is not exactly scientific thinking, uh, or, I mean, there, there are some differences between these two concepts. Because, uh, I mean, uh, the empirical point is like more, much more important in, in, in science. No, this is a very difficult question. In my view, typical uh, rationalistic, not rational, rationalistic, systems like Plato's, Descartes even, uh, were in fact irrational. This uh, inborn knowledge. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a simple test for this. If, for example, Husserl uh, 
had some idea of um, this uh, knowledge of essences by a special kind of intuition. Okay, so it is interesting philosophically, but the problem is that his idea was completely different than Kant's, for example. And what is the situation in science? You have a conflict between two interpretations of quantum mechanics. So one is, you can assume that one is correct, second not, or both are in, uh, uh, incorrect because maybe there is a third interpretation. However, it is difficult in science to uh, admit, to, to, to accept the two fundamental con uh, conceptions of rationality are correct. So I remember uh, a discussion with one student of Romarin Garden uh, about perception of colors. And this person uh, argued that we have access to essence of redness, of greenness, and so on, to essence of a given color. And I said, okay, uh, maybe I am not qu quite a uh, uh, competent person, but I al always see red uh, of a kind. So redness is rather an abstraction. And answer uh, was, you are, why? You are intelligent persons. <laughs> why you don't <laughs> see uh, redness? Then I said, okay, but it's the uh, end of discussion. The only, uh, uh, I think, defensive from empirical point of view, uh, uh, idea of uh, innate ideas is that of Noam Chomsky in philosophy of language, because it is something which has an operative uh, sense. For example, this argument why, for example, a child is able to speak when he or she is three years old, but uh, uh, using language is a very complicated uh, behavior or, or uh, ability. However, this, the, the, the same child has a problems with dressing, for example, which is a simple physical uh, ac uh, action. So I think that uh, Chomsky's answer that we have inborn linguist incompetence is something which explains something. I don't say that it is completely clear and, with, and without uh, difficulties. Yes, Chomsky was, is not quite uh, sure whether, uh, he's not interested in whether it's biological or some or mental or something like that. Uh, but okay, okay, so he says, we must accept that uh, Linguist incompetence is something innate in us. The next question is, what does it mean, of course? And I think that this, this is a scientific issue. So I, for Aydukevic, uh, it was interesting that typical philosophical rationalism was irrationalism, irrational. Thank you. So I'm just looking at the clock and it seems that we have uh, like half of an hour, so maybe it's good uh, time to uh, give opportunity to our audience to, to ask uh, questions to our guests. So um, do you have some questions? If please raise your hand. So I, I think, yes, uh, I mean, so my point of view, it could be uh, specific. Why? 
because I'm working, uh, there are different physicists, and they are uh, working in different fields of physics. Uh, I am a relativist, and I'm working with Einstein equations. And the Einstein equations in the form uh, that we, we have them, they were discovered in 1915, so more than 100 years ago. And this is like a very complicated mathematical structure. And uh, we did not change this equation. There are differential equations, so this means that uh, in order to find particular solution, uh, you have to, uh, you need uh, additional knowledge, uh, for example, the state of the universe at a given time. Let, let, let's put it this way. Uh, but uh, I identify physical laws with uh, differential equations. So it's not a problem that it, they do not tell you everything about the world because anyway, it's not the theory of uh, everything. And in relativity, we have this unusual property of these equations, that they contain more information about uh, external world than the Einstein knew at the time he was writing them down. For example, there are uh, several concepts hidden in the equations that uh, Einstein uh, initially disagreed and, uh, for many years. So uh, for me, uh, I have uh, this point of view that, of course, uh, Mathematics is much larger than, uh, than this part of mathematics that could be matched to the physical world. Uh, so we have to be careful because there are theories that, uh, I mean, people invent theories, they want to make new theories better than, than the old ones, but it seems that there is more math, mathematics than, uh, that some mathematics doesn't apply directly to, to the real world. But once we find some, uh, part of the mathematical structure that fits to reality in several points. Like Einstein, he proposed his theory, it was tested and you know the, how the, uh, it predicts the trajectory of light, uh, and there were later other tests. Uh, it, uh, I don't know if it's called a correct word, but it's uh, stick with reality. So then you can use it to discover the nature of the world, just uh, studying the mathematics of this theory that, that has already fitted uh, it some, to, to the some part of, of the world. And the, the most famous example is, of course, uh, black holes. Because, so Einstein in 1915, he did not, uh, he, he didn't even know that uh, there are other galaxies. Uh, so he had some very basic idea about uh, gravitation, and this is like observation in, in, of the symmetry in the real world. So like gravitation and acceleration, the uh, inertial forces, there are, is the same thing. So in, in Newton and Fiori it is not. Uh, Einstein was thinking about this, uh, you know, uh, person falling down, that it will not feel gravity. So he said that this is like a basic symmetry of physics, that it's the same thing. And this uh, led him to, to the Einstein equations. But he did not construct them to, to, to say something about black holes. And uh, they are complicated, they have uh, tens of thousands of, of terms, uh, and the physicists, they, they were studying them for 100 years. Like, several generation of, of physicists. So some people were studying equations, they died, another generation was studying equations using the mathematical uh, theorems of the previous generation. And after this 100 years, our civilization was able to, to construct gravitational waves detector and uh, the theories, they were able to, to produce patterns. So if there are somewhere in the universe black holes collide, there should be particular pattern detected by, by the detector, and it works. So it's, for me, it's like a very deep uh, a secret uh, uh, of the real world. How is that possible that you have this theory written by a man who didn't know about black holes, about, he didn't know that black holes exist, not, not to mention that uh, some properties of the black holes that you can, uh, that arise uh, during the collision. So. He, he didn't simply, uh, he didn't know about that. And then 
his equations in unchanged form because we are talking about uh, vacuum equations, vacuum Einstein equations. After 100 years, we were able to, to see that they exactly match the predictions, exactly match what we see in nature. So, uh, but of course, uh, this is a specific point of view because other physicists, uh, they work, uh, I don't know, in, in, um, <coughs> in other uh, branches of, of physics, they maybe have more, of, uh, I would say, fluent, uh, I mean, they change equations more often, they sometimes use effective equations. I, I don't use effective equations in, in, in my work. Uh, so they have uh, ability to change equations a little bit to use uh, different approximation and to put something by hand and so on. So they, they are not so strict on, on this uh, idea of, of mathematical work. But even if you look at uh, different aspects of, of, of this problem uh, of particle physics. In particle physics, we have a standard model, which is a model. I, I like to make this distinction between theory and the model. We have a standard model, and in the standard model, if you look how scientists work, how physicists work, is that they do not see things and describe them mathematically, as Professor Wolensky said, that uh, things could be described by mathematics. But phys particle physicists, they do not see particles in advance and describe them. They have the theory, they calculate what particles should exist, to make the theory consistent. And uh, and majority of, of particles in, in, in particle physics, there were some exceptions like uh, uh, muon and, and, and um, other particles, but majority of them, they were this, uh, discovered in advance in, in the mathematics and then just confirmed. So for me, this method of, of uh, how physics works is uh, like a confirmation uh, that the world is mathematical. Of course, there are uh, other cosmologists and they have some kind of extreme point of view. For, ex for example, Max Tegmark, he believes that uh, since we, okay, so there is something like a baggage in our theories. For example, I can, uh, you mentioned quantum mechanics, interpretation of quantum mechanics. But th this point of view assumes that uh, our brain needs interpretation of quantum mechanics, but what will stay if you would uh, remove this human baggage is just pure mathematics. So Max Tegmark, he believes that since we cannot tell the difference between pure mathematics and, and, uh, and uh, the physical objects, because this is the single description uh, we have, that it's the same thing. I mean, I'm against this uh, point of view, but there are su such people. So, uh, I don't know what you think on, on, on this topic. No, but we, no, okay, so I just, I, I, I was, uh, I remarked you said a certain equation was discovered as if it existed before but was hidden and you did not say it was invented. Uh, I think yes. it's, it's, a, it's revealing the Yes, so, so th this is important distinction, uh, but uh, I must say, even uh, because uh, people often misunderstand the, 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 this part, because of course the form of equation that Einstein discovered, it was dependent maybe on uh, the books he re read before and uh, maybe uh, uh, what he did this morning and, and so on, to the particular form. But the Einstein equations could be formulated in many different different forms. So, uh, what is universal is this mathematical structure that could be described by many different concepts. And, uh, for example, if you think about gravity, even about uh, weak gravity, so-called weak, uh, I mean, uh, like Newtonian gravity, okay? So, Newton uh, said, okay, we have two masses, so there, there will be a force acting between these masses and it depends on, on the parameter uh, called mass of one thing and another. And people has this vision of, of the universe when you have uh, like planets uh, and uh, other things and there are forces, everywhere are forces. But several, I mean, like 20 years later, uh, Bernoulli, he said, uh, he proposed uh, something like equivalent mathematical formulation 
a different point of view that if you I, you have a bod, uh, body, then there is like, like a gravitational potential produced by the, by this body. So it's like a scalar function in, in this room produced by this thing. And then if you want to know how this thing will move, uh, you will have to know this scalar function and you can calculate how it will move. So uh, in some sense, uh, it's a different vision, the same mathematical structure, but different uh, uh, way of talking about it. So forces or gravitational potential is like a human dependent uh, thing, but if you remove them, then it's just mathematical structure which describes gravity. And of course, you can take Einstein theory and uh, make weak field approximation. And in this weak field approximation, you will not talk about uh, gravitational potential, you will not take, uh, talk about forces, you will have space-time and small curvature of space-time. It's completely different language, uh, completely different uh, uh, explanation, but the essential part of, of this mathematical structure is exactly the same. So, I mean, this is my, my point of view. But uh, if you don't have uh, comments, so maybe there will be some comments from uh, audience. Yes, there is a... Thank you, Michał Brzeza Brzezina, uh, Warsaw School of Economics. So it's not gonna be about Einstein, it's not gonna be about philosophy, it's gonna be about economics and rationality. Um, uh, so it's to Professor Delacroix. So you talked a lot about uh, people, our uh, assumption of uh, agents being uh, rational, and of course that's a sort of foundation of modern uh, macroeconomics, uh, rational decisions, rational expectations, and so on. Um, for many years, I, I've been working in monetary economics, and for many years I worked with models with uh, you know rationality of agents assumed. Uh, but uh, you know as well as I do that we have lots and lots of evidence that people are not rational and that they are, they are systematically not rational in a, in a systematic way. Even uh, Nobel Prizes have been given for this to Kahneman, for instance. Um, and uh, I wonder if we, but we, we, still, we still do it, we still work with this assumption. I recently stopped, so I recently started to uh, to deviate from the rational expectations assumption, for instance, in, 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 in modeling monetary economics. Uh, I started to assume things like people being myopic, and once you do it, you figure out that, uh, you know, this, to a large extent, changes our conclusions, for instance, about how monetary policy works. And uh, I wonder, haven't, what's your opinion on this, haven't we uh, gotten too comfortable with the rational, uh, rationality assumption. Uh, we, we admit it's wrong, but we still stick to it and we may be drawing very wrong conclusions about you know, how the world works, uh, how we advise our, I don't know, uh, policymakers, for instance, and, uh, and so on. Thanks a lot. Yes, so thank you for your uh, reaction. Yes, so indeed, so today there are more and more uh, attempts to, to incorporate into modeling so deviations from rationality. So sometimes it's called uh, behavioral uh, assumptions. Uh, and in particular, in the big models that uh, are used in a monetary macro, probably it's those that you have in mind, uh, that are, for example, used by central banks to, to determine their policy. Um, there is more and more uh, attempts to, to introduce non, so behavioral assumptions. Um, so I'm not a Taliban of rationality, so that's fine. Uh, but the question I always have is um, how do you do to, to discipline the choice of divergence you will assume from the rational expectation uh, benchmark? So rational expectations, so rationality, I think we should see it as a benchmark. Now if you want to deviate, the question is how do you deviate from it? 
and how this deviation, because you can always choose the deviation that will, that will lead the policy you like, no? So that's the risk I see uh, to those deviations. But there are certainly very smart way of, of doing it. That um, so I'm not working in, on that topic, but uh, that's way. And in particular, how do you address also, so what I try to explain that uh, behaviors matter for policy. It's related to something which is called the Lucas critique. So now I'm citing some authors because you, you, you cited many. So <laughs> Robert Lucas also uh, passed away recently, but then that was his critique to the old generation, the models of the 70s, that when you do a policy, of course, people's expectations will change and you need to incorporate that in your analysis, otherwise you are wrong. So now, if you are non-rational people, how do you address this? It seems to me that you might be again subject to that critique. So, but there are probably ways to, to address it. Yes, so do, do we have uh, more questions? So there is a question. Uh, a question to Professor Woleński uh, connected with your uh, <laughs> devastating criticism against uh, phenomenology. Uh, my question is, uh, who specifically claims to have access uh, to the essence of redness? Okay. Huh? Yes. Okay. And my question is, uh, who uh, specifically claims to have access to the essence of redness? My question is connected with some understanding of essence. I, I suppose essence is usually understood as a set of qualities that, uh, such that, that uh, an object must have in order to belong to some kind. And uh, the uh, expression uh, essence of redness seems to be devoid of meaning. Uh. So the question was stated by Professor Danuta Girulanka, who was a very faithful uh, pupil of Roman in Garden. And as far as I understand this philosophy, because it was Husserl in Garden and so on, according to them, we have access by a kind of intuition to so-called essences, eidos in Latin, and that's it, that we have, we, ha we can perceive in a very special way, the sense of this word, pure redness, pure greenness, pure any other quality. It was a philosophical view Moreover, we can establish a priori some relations between uh, eidos, those eidoses. I, of course, it is not, not my view. I, uh, I've never understood this correctly because one objection is I, I repeat. There are two, several different where, uh, statements about such things. Kant's uh, answer was different, Hegel's answer was different, Husserl, and so on. So uh, I cannot accept such a uh, si situation, even not as, as scientific. 
because I don't believe that philosophy is a science, like physics or mathematics, but is rational or not. If someone finishes the discussion, you are an intelligent person, you should understand this proposal. So I say, okay, this is the end of discussion. Even if, uh, if I uh, have different view than uh, uh, an other philosopher. So for me, rationality is that we at least completely or almost completely are able to uh, state our positions. And we can leave the discussion with, okay, at least I understand your position. But I don't understand the position of Husserl. Moreover, I, I, I don't deny, of course, that Husserl was a great philosopher. However, I don't trust a philosopher who changes such fundamental views three times in his life and finishes, it is a statement to his wife just before death, now I see truth, however, I cannot tell you what, what it is. It is for me a, a sign of uh, maybe respected is irrationality, but still irrationality. I can perfectly understand what Bertrand Russell wanted to say, what Carnap wanted to say, Frege and most analytic uh, philosophers. I understand, of course, words by difficult to understand ideas. So this is a question of this redness. I don't understand what is pure quality. If you understand, I am jealous, of course. I'm sorry, sorry. Yes. Uh, do we have more questions? Yes. To Professor Delacroix, uh, you are talking that you are now, do you hear me, uh, what I'm? Okay, you are saying that now you have to put many deviations into your mathematical models from the so-called strong goal-related rationality. So, this is also in a kind of rationalizing deviations, but it's a much broader understanding of rationality. Can you, can you make a comment on this? It, because it's, a, it's another kind of rationality. So, yes, all these uh, behavioral approaches, they also use mathematical models to model behavior. And you can, in a sense, uh, describe how, for example, uh, expectations about the future will be determined in a non-rational way. So maybe uh, the simplest deviation would be just to be myopic, supposing that things will not change. What will be, what will be the stock market next year? Same as this year. So that would be myopic expectation. You could put that in equations and in a sense, it will be mathematics as well. And so in a sense, it's rational, but it's mathematical at least. Um, but the alternative, you know, there are some people who say, oh, those economists who use mathematics, they are deeply wrong. So economics is a social science that should not be based on mathematics at all. Uh, That's fine, so they are free to do what they want uh, as a type of research, but I think it's still fruitful to have uh, a formal approach. 
in particular because at some point you may also try to to confront it in a structural way to, to data to that are becoming more and more uh, important uh, these days. Um, and by the way, in behavioral approaches, so again, I'm not, uh, I'm not in, 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 into this, but the, uh, one way maybe to discipline is to run experiments, lab experiments or field experiments to try to, to have hints on how, how those deviations from rationality, what, what, is their, what is their inner logic? Like I think in um, those who do monetary policy, they could also try to use, uh, to survey firms and people about their for what will be their, for what is their forecast about the future and try to see if there is a, a, another logic behind that. Thank you. So I think we don't have uh, much more time for questions. So I don't know if you would like to sum uh, summarize somehow our uh, meeting. If not, then just thank you for accepting uh, our invitation. Thank you for coming. So I think that we can thank the speakers. Thank you.